Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good day to all of our students. So uh, today we will have a practical session for limb node pathology. Uh, on a lighter note, for those of you who are interested in anime, uh, if you want to learn about uh, immune systems, uh, lymphoid systems, you can uh, watch this anime, Cell at Work. Uh, this is the character for B lymphocytes. So it's actually uh, very entertaining and it's actually uh, quite uh, up to certain level is factually correct and helps you to remember more on the function of each component of our blood. Okay, so uh, today uh, these are the contents of our practical session. Uh, we will discuss on a bit of a gross uh, and a histology changes of a benign lymph node, and uh, we will uh, <clears throat> we will discuss two cases of a lymph node pathology. Okay, so this is a gross experience of a benign lymph node. As you can see, uh, this lymph node is uh, appeared tan vaguely nodular. It's about one point five, one point six. 1.7 centimeter and uh, usually for a normal lymph node usually it will be less than 1 cm usually if any lymph node more than 1 cm usually is pathological uh, but pathological doesn't mean it's always malignant it can be benign uh, like this uh, uh, picture in front of you uh, this is a benign uh, reactive lymph node in a child okay so these are how benign lymph node looks like. Okay, so on a histology of benign lymph nodes, you have four regions in the lymph nodes. You have a cortex, which composed of lymphoid follicles, mental zone, and marginal zone. You have paracortex, where you have these interfollicular areas. Uh, you have medullary uh, region, you have which have these cords of cell lymphocytes, plasmacytoid lymphocytes, mature plasma cell and plasma blast and you have these sinuses uh, which uh, which line by thin pale staining endothelial cell which acquire lining of macrophages uh, within the hilum why uh, these four regions is important because uh, each of the pathology uh, may affect and uh, may arise from these four region uh, differently for example where you have uh, B-cell lymphoma, uh, usually it can arise in the this cortical cortex region, where in uh, if the uh, the lymphoma is uh, is uh, originate from the uh, germinal center site, for example, uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, usually it's uh, arise in the germinal center, which uh, later I will describe why it is germinal center in the lymphoid follicles and uh, for paracortex usually you have this a uh, lot of T cells and uh, uh, plasma cells in between so uh, usually the infection can affect this area more and also the T lymphoma, T lymphoma may affect this area more and for the sinuses uh, you can see uh, the early phase of uh, metastasis you can see because of this uh, a lot of endothelial cells okay so this how a uh, benign uh, lymph node looks like in the low magnification you can see here there's a lot of uh, lymphoid follicles uh, which uh, uh, which uh, which has a prominent germinal center and rimmed by this well-defined mental zone. Uh, so this region is a cortex region and in between this uh, cortex, the lymphoid follicle and mental zone and uh, you have this paracortex region which I explain usually is composed of uh, T lymphocytes and uh, plasma cells and then you have this sinuses here uh, and here you have the medullary region. So this is how a low magnification of a lymph node uh, looks like, uh, of a benign lymph node looks like. 
So if you look at the higher magnification, you can see these uh, lymphoid follicles. Uh, in a benign uh, lymphoid follicles, you have this uh, dark zone and lighter zone. Uh, why is it has a dark zone and lighter zone? Because uh, usually in a dark zone, you have this uh, central blast. In lighter zone, you have this uh, uh, you have this some tangible body macrophages and uh, some uh, some uh, mature uh, B lymphocytes and some usually T helper uh, lymphocytes uh, within the lymphoid follicle. If you see there is a this uh, distinct uh, light zone and dark zone, this these are the characteristic of a benign lymph nodes together with tangible body macrophages. And usually this lymph node rimmed by well-defined mental zone. Uh, this is the mental zone. Uh, usually it's composed of mature lymphocytes. Okay. If you look at the higher magnification, as I mentioned earlier, you have in dark zone, you have this central blast. Uh, central blast means usually the lymphocytes is a bit larger and you can see there's a nucleoli. Usually for central blast, the nucleoli is uh, is a bit peripherally at, at the peripheral area, and usually if let's say the nucleoli is in the center, you have uh, it, it it is called immunoblast, and uh, within the lymphoid follicle, benign lymphoid follicle also, you have this uh, tangible body macrophages. So if the lymphoid follicle has um, prominent germinal, well-defined germinal center, and you have this well-defined uh, mental zone rimming the area, and within the germinal center, you can see this tangible body macrophages uh, with uh, light and darker area. Usually, this uh, when uh, these are the uh, characteristic of uh, benign or reactive lymph nodes. Okay. So we go to the first case. Okay, you can see here uh, in the gross uh, section, the lymph node is significantly larger. Here is about maybe about 5 cm, uh, about 5 cm. And uh, you can see here, there's a multiple yellowish area. Usually if you palpate, usually it's a bit soft and cheesy like this under necrotic area which we call caseous necrosis, okay? This is the characteristic here. Here is a, and usually in this lymph node, it doesn't affect the whole lymph node. There are some area which are preserved, like this area, the, the lymph node is preserved. This area is uh, affected by this caseous necrosis, okay? So if you look uh, at the histological slides of this uh, pathology, you can see there's a partial effacement of lymphoid architecture. What do I mean by partial effacement of lymphoid architecture? Uh, usually the normal lymphoid architect architecture, as you can see in the previous slide, you can see there's a uh, very well distinct, well defined distinct uh, cortex and paracortex area. And if let's say uh, there's a disruption of this architecture, we call it uh, effacement. If there is a uh, total loss of that architecture, we call it total effacement. If partial loss, we call it partial effacement. So there is a partial effacement of lymphoid architecture by this well-formed granuloma. So uh, what does it, this granuloma compose of? If you look at the higher magnification, it is composed of epithelioid histiocyte Epithelial histiocyte is a it's a histiocyte or uh, or also uh, it's actually a, it's a macrophages within the tissue, uh, which uh, which has a pale nucleus and usually the shape is like a slipper, so we call it epithelial histiocyte, and you have this multinucleated giant cell here uh, and. Uh, it, within the granuloma, it is rimmed by uh, this mature lymphocyte. Okay, these are the characteristics uh, of the uh, granuloma. 
and uh, within this granuloma, you can see uh, there is a uh, Langhan type multinucleated giant cell. Uh, usually, this uh, giant cell you have this multinucleated area in the periphery, and there is a clear area in the center. Okay, so this is the characteristic of caseating granulomatous inflammation or caseating granulomatous lymph adenitis. Okay, consistent with in this region, we, uh, usually it, it is caused by tuberculous lymph adenitis. But usually, uh, the gold standard of diagnosis uh, still uh, is uh, preferable either you, uh, molecular technique or culture. That's the gold standard lah, for the diagnosis of this tuberculous lymph adenitis. But histologically, usually these features, uh, usually most of the time it's uh, is caused by tuberculous lymph adenitis. Okay, for granulomatous inflammation of the lymph node, you have caseating and non-caseating. Uh, for undergraduate, usually we focus on caseating granulomatous inflammation. Lah. For postgraduate, you have this non-caseating granulomatous inflammation. You, it is caused by a lot of other granulomatous inflammation such as um, sarcoidosis, uh, etc. So, okay, we move on to the uh, next case. Okay, so uh, this case, you can see uh, the lymph nodes uh, is enlarged uh, and you have this irregular pan firm to hard mass. Okay, you can see the border is not well defined and it's almost replacing all of the uh, lymph node uh, tissue. So you, you hardly see any normal lymph, lymph node tissue here. And um, usually this is uh, in quite advanced metastatic, uh, advanced lesion. Uh, usually in the early lesion, you can see uh, in the subcapsular region. You can see uh, sometimes if uh, in the early stage, it's only confined to this subcapsular region. But in this case, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, it's almost replacing all of the lymphoid tissue. For undergraduate, usually uh, you, we give you in the exam like this uh, tissue, but in practical, uh, in real life, usually uh, it's very, some some of the uh, lesion is just confined to the subcapsular region, makes it difficult for uh, us to, um, to detect. Okay, so when we, uh, when we, process it to the histological slides. Uh, this is the what the histopathological uh, examination uh, reveal. You can see there's a partial effacement, again, partial effacement of lymphoid architecture. Usually, uh, in uh, this uh, kind of lesion, uh, there's just a partial effacement. Uh, there's still, uh, even though the uh, gross appearance just now is almost replacing all of the lymphoid tissue, uh, but in uh, in microscopic uh, appearance, usually they will have a bit of the normal uh, residual lymphoid tissue, as you can see in this region. Here is the normal residual lymphoid tissue, and uh, you can see here there's a clusters of malignant cells arranged in papillary pattern. What do I mean by papillary pattern? Is actually it's like a finger-like projection. And in the center, you have this blood vessel. So this is the malignant cell arranged in papillary pattern. So uh, usually, as I mentioned earlier, in initial phase, usually it's infiltration within the sinus or subcapsular region. Uh, and you can see there's a, here you can see the clusters of malignant cell here in the follicular, uh, follicular pattern. And here you can see this is the papillary pattern. It's like a finger-like projection. And here in the center is the blood vessel. And here you can see samoma bodies. Okay, these are samoma bodies. Uh, very nice. Okay, if you look at the highest magnification, uh, this cell is uh, displaying uh, nuclear clearing. You can see the nucleus. Is, uh, real, is a clear ground glass appearance. 
uh, due to the clear chromatin. Uh, this is what we uh, call often aminoclei. And you can see uh, the, the nucleus also have this grooving. Grooving, there's a, uh, it's a groove here. You can see uh, some, some looks like a coffee bean. There's a groove, okay. And in some areas, uh, like the arrow here, it says uh, intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusion. Uh, means the, uh, there's a inclusion from the cytoplasm goes to the nucleus. So this is uh, what we call intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusion. Some of the pathologies call it uh, nuclear pseudo inclusion uh, because it's not a, it's a, it's a actually is from the cytoplasmic uh, inclusion to the nucleus, not the true inclusion. Okay, so um, in this uh, case, it is a metastatic carcinoma consistent with metastatic papillary thyroid carcinoma. So for papillary thyroid carcinoma, usually the, it has uh, three character uh, three characteristic lah. You have uh, these uh, changes to the size and uh, architecture, and you have these uh, uh, changes in the in the membrane, and you also have uh, changes in the chromatin. So usually two out of three, uh, it's the diagnosis usually involves at least two out of three changes, then we can term it uh, metast uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma. Lah. But if let's say uh, it is within the lymph node, uh, it's usually, it's almost always metastatic carcinoma. Lah. Okay, uh, usually, um, usually in uh, practice, uh, usually we all, we still do immunohistochemistry. Usually we do uh, CK7, CK20 uh, for the origin and sometimes we do uh, TTF1 uh, to, uh, to TTF1 and thyroglobulin. Uh, to uh, confirm the origin from the uh, thyroid gland. Uh, but for undergraduate, usually uh, we, uh, by this uh, description, we can accept the diagnosis as this. Okay, we move on to the next case. So, the uh, when you examine uh, this lymph node macroscopically, when you bisected it, you can see uh, there is irregular tan firm to hard mass here all around it's replacing all the normal lymphoid architecture here you can see there's a lot of this uh, quite well circumscribed uh, tan uh, mass usually it's a bit nodular pattern here you can see it's separated by this uh, uh, this fibrous tissue and in between there's uh, some whitish component like this area you can see this is the area of necrosis so basically uh, when you see grossly the lymph node is enlarged and it is uh, having nodular pattern uh, with the there is mass in nodular pattern uh, which is firm to hard and usually tan to whitish to grayish in color and you can see some areas of necrosis so when you look, uh, when you uh, slice it and you send for histopathological analysis, you can see there is a total effacement of the lymphoid architecture. You cannot see all those, the lymphoid follicle, well-formed lymphoid follicle with uh, containing tangible body macrophages rim by mental zone. So you can see all of it is already effaced by this tumor so this tumor actually is uh, is arranged in nodular pattern you can see all the small small nodules some are big nodule and in between here you can see areas of necrosis and uh, you can see uh, it's very pinkish appearance so uh, of course it's separated by this broad collagen septae so basically it's uh, there is a total effacement of lymphoid architecture so when you look at the higher magnification you can see uh, it is pinkish uh, or because of this there's a lot of eosinophils in between so this is eosinophils this is the orange color one 
again this is eosinophil 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 there are few uh, cases which are uh, common have uh, a lot of eosinophil infiltrates in between particularly these are the tumor cells and of course you can see there's a scattered large tumor cell like this area this is large tumor cell scattered this tumor cell quite a large number so if you look closely this tumor cell actually is uh, quite large and uh, some of it is uh, binucleated uh, which, uh, ves which have vesicular nuclei prominent nucleoli and you have a lot abundant quite abundant moderate to abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm hence that is why it is uh, quite uh, pinkish because it has uh, abundant cytoplasm on top of this eosinophil uh, adjacent to it and of course you have this atypical uh, mitosis and usually in postgraduate studies usually we will ask about this also this is what we call mummified cells which is the tumor cells is uh, dying so we call it's like a mummy so we call it mummified cells so these are the characteristic of this tumor and in some of the tumor you have this uh, binucleated uh, large tumor cells with uh, very eosinophilic bright eosinophilic uh, nucleoli it's like a owl's eye so it, this is what we call Ritstenberg cell so this is the uh, characteristic of a uh, limb node of uh, classic Hodgkin lymphoma if you ask undergraduate usually this is acceptable answer but if you ask postgraduate student usually we will expect uh, nodular sclerosing type subtype lah. so these are my references and uh, the, uh, if you have any question you can always ask in the smart v3 forum or during the session itself and that's all from me okay thank you and have a nice day